himself and his wife Maura have kindly rescheduled to join us today. Um, Michael curated the Swiss Touch and Landscape Architecture ex Exhibition, which you saw across the road, and went on to after the exhibition for after the lecture. Um, we were afforded an interesting perspective of Swiss landscape architecture today from a man who first of all studied comparative literature and philosophy and now teaches landscape design in Harvard and Geneva. So thanks to Michael David. Thanks a lot, uh, first of all, for uh, having organized uh, this uh, exhibition on Swiss landscape architecture. Um, I'm very grateful that it is shown at your school because uh, I think the places which are more most important for us are schools of architecture, landscape architecture, and generally places where a lot of people see these projects and uh, hopefully learn something for, uh, from what we try to show. Swiss Landscape Architecture is a project by Proevetia, it's a Swiss cultural agency and it's a, uh, the idea is to show uh, different uh, forms of Swiss culture around the world and uh, I think this is the 14th place where we show this exhibition in 8 or 9 months, so it travels around the world and uh, generally speaking it's not uh, it's not a national or nationalistic presentation of Swiss national uh, landscape architecture. We're more interested in landscape architecture than in the fact that this is Swiss. So, and that's what I would like to present to you uh, in this small uh, introduction. I hope not to be too long. We're starting now. Uh, thanks again, especially to Andrea and Colin for having organized uh, the exhibition and made it possible that we can show it here. So, uh, as you are uh, in the School of Architecture, <coughs> we could start our journey or um, asking what is landscape architecture generally? What the kind of people are these uh, who do landscape architecture? And anyhow, where does landscape, landscape architecture go? Does it go anywhere? Uh, and uh, when did it start and what are its relation to architecture? So there are many, many questions when we start to deal with landscape architecture, not only in Ireland or uh, at your school where you don't have a program in landscape architecture, but even in places where you really have a substantial program in landscape architecture, there are so many open questions and many problems. How do landscape architects work with the architects? What do they do? What is their field of activity and so on? So, uh, uh, what does a landscape architect do? And what, is, uh, what are his methods and uh, how does he work and uh, what kind of work does he uh, present to the public? Uh, well, let's start uh, with uh, this uh, card, uh, with this uh, visiting card, uh, professional card. It's, uh, it has been uh, presented by the man who maybe was the first landscape architect, Humphrey Repton. So Humphrey Repton started in Britain with uh, landscape architecture in 1789 and he had a very keen sense of business so he immediately uh, invented uh, an image of, uh, of himself and he called himself no more a gardener but a landscape gardener. And so he's at the beginning of the profession and here you see uh, how proudly he shows what he does. So he translates his projects which he draws into reality, we'll see in one moment what Humphrey Repton did and how he worked. And this is another person, so uh, the discipline is very young. Uh, this is Jean-Marie Morel, a Frenchman, and around 1804 he called himself architect paysagist. So he was uh, maybe the first man who identified himself no more as an architect and as a gardener, but as a landscape architect. And he was an engineer by study and formation, and then he became a landscape architect. And this is a man who is uh, even more important for the profession. It's uh, Frederick Law Olmsted. I think most of you know about him or know him, even if you don't know exactly about his biography. And he's the inventor of Central Park and of many, many um, other projects. And he, he became uh, very well known. And I will come back to, it, to his person. And finally, this is a Swiss landscape architect, maybe the most important and the most well known. And if I say well known, he's not even known by his internationally by the profession. But among landscape architects, he's the most well known. Is Dieter Kienast. He died in 2000. 
and he was a Swiss landscape architect, but he is almost uh, as many of many other of these uh, figures and of important <coughs> um, landscape architects. He's not well known enough, and this is one of the ideas of our show in order to uh, not to popularize it, but simply to explain what landscape architects do and how they do it. So how do they do it? Well, there, the second step is representation, because uh, landscape architecture has to do something with representation. And Humphrey Repton uh, already invented in the, at the end of the 18th century something quite important, so that's what he called his red books. And the red books were <coughs> books he went to his clients, he would spend three or four, five days or ten days with the client, and then he would say, okay, mm, I make my drawings, I make my watercolors, and when I, in um, two or three months, I will come back and I will bring you the project. And you have to pay a lot for the project because that's what is worth something. Everyone can garden and can do the actual work. But I will invent something. I will invent something new. And so he, he invented a method of representation too. So he always started with the status quo, the existing situation, and then he drew something which will come. So he made his client dream. He said, that's what I invent for you. That's how, we'll look, how it will look in the future. And so these beautiful illustrated books, and many of them survive, uh, they were very, um, they're very interesting instruments because uh, by showing to his clients the existing situation and by confronting it to what it would become, uh, he really invented uh, the landscape architecture project. And he didn't stop in uh, presenting these books, but he even wanted to educate his uh, clients. So he, here you see himself uh, upstairs, the man in black, and uh, uh, down the, the, the person sitting is a, his client, and he obliged his clients to draw and to watercolor their own uh, domains. So he said it's not enough to, and I think this is very interesting, so even as architects or landscape architects, we <coughs> have very often this situation that we have clients who have almost no culture or very often when the more money they have the less culture they have and so we have to educate them we have to tell them listen it's not enough to pay for the project you have to understand what you pay for and Rapton uh, was uh, so the first landscape architect he already tried to explain what uh, how, how you should interpret uh, the things which the landscape architect uh, built for you <coughs> you see uh, some uh, paintings by Jean-Marie Morel so he was an engineer, but at the same time he was an artist. And so the artistic and the uh, engineer part come together very often in uh, landscape architecture. And here naturally you recognize the project of um, Central Park in New York, which is still something very important. And here is a drawing, a uh, sort of collage by Dieter Kinas. Naturally the forms of representation of landscape architecture changed from the 18th now to the 19th, and then again from the 19th to the 20th century. But representation is something very important. <laughs> we shouldn't forget that many of the, this is true for architecture too, true, too but uh, especially for landscape architecture and for the history of gardens, we don't have to forget that most of the gardens and many of the projects of landscape architecture, even famous ones and important ones, with time disappear. They will disappear after 50 years, 100 years, two centuries, and the only thing which remains is the representation, the drawing, the image, the photography. So representation is a key issue and we shouldn't forget it. Sometimes we have uh, actual projects which survive. This is a project by Humphrey Repton and still in Britain and in other places where, uh, we, we can visit happily we, uh, some uh, places and sites which Humphrey Repton transformed himself. By Jean-Marie Morel, we have only one project. We think he made more than 45, but only one project survived, so most of the other project disappeared, and it's not in a very good shape. From Olmsted, we have a lot of projects, Central Park, Franklin Park in Boston, and <clears throat> naturally, if we look for someone like Kinast, the Swiss landscape architect which I showed before, uh, you see here, uh, there is a very interesting project. It's a cemetery <coughs> in the eastern part of Switzerland, and we're happy enough to be able to go to these places and to try to understand what these people did when they did it. <clears throat> um, this is another interesting project by a Swiss landscape architect and I want to show it 
to you because he is a part of our ex exhibition. His name is Ernst Kramer. He worked in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And you see, this is a competition. This was a, a place of a national exhibition, a sort of national gardening exhibition. And these exhibitions were very often places where people invented new forms. And I show it to you because he, uh, <clears throat> he drew and he built a, a so-called Garden of the Poet. So this is a Garden of the Poet. And uh, <clears throat> some photographs survive. Very often these projects are destroyed. But Ernst Kramer very directly influenced this artist. Many of you may know him. So there is a direct influence by this Swiss landscape architect who almost no one knows except specialists on this central figure of 20th century art. And this is Robert Smithson. And Robert Smithson's Spiral Hill, which is one of the few <coughs> works which survived by Robert Smithson, Spiral Hill and Spiral Jetty. So Spiral Hill and generally the thought and the <coughs> art of Robert Smithson was very directly influenced by this uh, Swiss landscape architect. So one of the ideas is to uh, get uh, to know what did these people do and why did they do it. And uh, because I showed I show before uh, an artificial mountain, a foam mountain by Ernst Kramer, uh, we can, the theme of the artificial mountain is still very much present in our ex even in our exhibition. This is an artificial mountain uh, built today by Christophe Giraud. Christophe Giraud, he was, was one of the best, uh, internationally best known Swiss landscape architects. And he is just building now a huge artificial mountain, sort of a mount. It's linked to the construction of the biggest rail, the biggest tunnel of the world, 60 kilometers long, uh, which is just now uh, in, under construction in Switzerland. Mountains, Switzerland and mountains. Generally, uh, when people think of Switzerland, they <coughs> think automatically of the mountains and of mountain landscapes and of the Alps. And indeed, uh, uh, art historians uh, say that uh, probably the first landscape, landscape painting, where you can really identify a historical exact place, an empirically existing place, is this one. It was painted in 1444 by a a uh, German painter called Konrad Ritz, and this is Lake Geneva, and you see uh, a mountain called Mol, and behind the Mont Blanc, and uh, uh, so this still exists today. So mountains and the natural environment were always very important to, in order to understand uh, Swiss landscape. <clears throat> but um, nature, wild nature, was for a very long time uh, something which uh, people didn't recognize positively. We could say that from the 4th century to the 17th century, generally in Europe, wild nature, <coughs> beautiful wild nature, uh, pristine nature, uh, was not recognized positively because it was generally interpreted as something profoundly negative. Why the negativity of nature generally in European thought and in European tradition? Well, it was linked to two <coughs> important uh, facts, or not facts, but two ideas. The first one is naturally fall. We all descend from Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve uh, lived in a perfect nature, but uh, once uh, disbehaving, and uh, they had to leave uh, once they wanted to eat of the apple of knowledge, they had to leave a paradise and uh, hence they had to live in a negative nature. And this negative nature was full of monsters, it was full of illness, uh, it was full of uh, negative signs. And the second very important element is the flood. The great flood or deluge was interpreted until the 17th century as something which really has taken place. So people were convinced that the nature in which we lived generally in Europe was a bad nature, a nature marked by fall and by negativity because God wanted to punish us. He wanted to punish us because the first humanity didn't obey. And so he destroyed, he deleted the first humanity and with the 40 days of rain, etc. And uh, after uh, we, we all descend from the second humanity, the humanity which survived the great flood. And so the flood, the deluge, was something which uh, was uh, thought of as a historical event. 
and it explained why, generally speaking, uh, especially mountains and mountain areas and wild mountain scenery was until the 17th century considered as something completely negative and ugly. If we look to the people who traveled through the Alps, and people always traveled to the Alps, so even from Ireland people came to, they had to cross the Alps in order, in order to go to Rome, and there was always some traffic. But all the people who had to cross the Alps and who came into the wild Alpine scenery, they detested to be there. They found it extremely ugly, and they speak about tumoral forms, they speak about the Alps as something extremely ugly and horrible and the only thing they wanted to avoid white nature and white sceneries. And so at the same time, the white nature and the alpine nature was considered as being full of monsters, full of all kinds of monsters, monsters and uh, dragons and snakes. And so you see that even very, very uh, people who were very well taught in uh, sciences and uh, who were very open-minded, they still thought that the Alps were full of these things. These are drawings of a beautiful book published by <coughs> a Swiss doctor. He was a, he was a, um, he was a doctor and at the same time a very good mathematician and he was a very bright guy. But at the same time he published a book about the dragons he would meet in the Swiss Alps if he would go there. So you see, so strong, this was his this person, Scheuchzer, uh, is his name, so an 18th century scientist, very important scientist, very bright guy, but he was convinced somehow that the Alps were full of monsters and full of these things, and he even illustrated his books. He said, if you go in these regions, please don't go to, uh, don't go do any mountaineering because it's very dangerous. And so the Alps were considered as being the place of the devil. They were the place of the devil and with all kinds of temptations. So you see that globally speaking, uh, nature and Swiss Alpine nature was considered as a place of the devil and of a sort of profound negativity. And it took a long time that nature was seen in its reality. This is nature, it's a personification, an allegory of nature. And here the philosopher uh, finally shows nature, how nature really exists. And in order to transform the idea of wild nature and of nature generally from something negative into positive, many things took place, the aesthetic of the sublime, physical theology, but it's important to mention maybe two or three uh, central figures in Switzerland. The first one is Haller. Haller was a very, very famous mathematician, uh, Europe-wide. He was a professor in Göttingen or, uh, as a young man of mathematics. He works in botanics and many, many other sciences, published a lot of articles. And Haller uh, made a journey through the Alps when he was a young man in 1728. And after he published a poem, which was translated immediately after its publication in German in 1731 into all the European languages. And it was a sort of big success. And Haller was one of the first ones who said, no, if you go into the, if you, if you look to nature, and if you look to wild nature, especially if you look to the Alps, the Alps are really uh, extremely positive places, because uh, uh, the, the, the air is good there, uh, because uh, there is better living than in the cities, and uh, generally speaking, people are free, and he even invented something, the myth of the good mountaineer. Now, mountaineers are not better or worse than only other people, but Haller invented this uh, very popular idea, it became very popular, that in some high mountains you had some good people, you had some people who were not destroyed by southern European Catholic decadence, so they were not like the French or the Italian or the Spanish who were lost anyhow with the Vatican, etc. But you had there some people who somehow remained pure, and they remained pure because their, um, their worldview was marked by necessity. Because as you know, Switzerland has almost no uh, natural resources except water. And so he said because people were poor there and because they had to cope with necessity, uh, they uh, invented a way of living which is more natural, they are free, they are democratic. And so Hummer's ideas became very, very popular and his poem was translated and then circulated with a lot of illustrations, so it was illustrated and all this transformed the idea of nature for the Swiss and generally in Switzerland. And then uh, comes a second person which was 
even more influential. And this is naturally Jean-Jacques Rousseau. You remember Jean-Jacques Rousseau is a Swiss too, and he is, uh, was born in Geneva. And Rousseau, uh, he wrote a European bestseller in the 18th century, uh, Julie ou la Nouvelle Héloïse. It was a novel in letters, and in this novel, uh, his main figure, saint preur takes up this idea of uh, the mountain areas and of wild nature as the real places uh, which really are authentic places. And so uh, Rousseau uh, contributed himself to, to popularize again uh, Alpine nature, Swiss nature, and uh, his books were very successful and they traveled around the world. And then uh, there are other people like their, uh, their Horace Benedict de Saussure, who was uh, one of the first people on the Mont Blanc. So there was a, uh, an important work in order to, trans to transform the idea of uh, the wild nature as something profoundly negative into something profoundly positive. And so again here the main idea was the aesthetics of the sublime. The aesthetics of the sublime was popularized first by John Dennis, who <coughs> at the end of the 17th century made his grand tour, and then by Edison and Burke. And so it took some time, but if you think uh, Swiss landscape, Swiss landscapes, generally speaking, Around 1700, no one would have been interested in a Swiss landscape. No one would have done a journey to Switzerland. No one would have even wanted to know some Swiss landscapes. And around 1800, everyone in Europe will come to Switzerland. And so Swiss landscapes will become very sexy, very trendy. Everyone wants to see these landscapes, to draw them, to describe them, to write poems about. So it becomes a sort of European craze. And so the aesthetics of sublime uh, was one of the uh, elements to which <coughs> changed and transformed the way people interpreted wild nature. So now, uh, during the 18th century, people would come into the Alps and study nature, they would draw it, they would start to <coughs> look to different things like glaciers. And here you see the sublime. Mankind, the human beings, become very small. You see them at the left hand. They're very, very small figures and the glaciers are something huge. And so now the, the Alps become the sign of sublimity and almost everyone, not only from Europe, but even from America and from other parts of the world, will start to come to Europe and especially to Switzerland in order to um, <coughs> study <coughs> to study white nature. And this is a Swiss painter called Kaspar Wolf and uh, he painted a lot of uh, um, places which became topoi, they became really uh, cliché places, so everyone would start to know what these places would like, so more and more people would come there and they would study these places and they would draw them, and you see this is the Staubach, a very famous waterfall, and it was painted by dozens and dozens of painters. In the, already in the 18th century, and here you see in the 19th century, people would come from America, for example, from the Hudson River School, and they would paint this very, very famous place. Uh, so, by painting, and by the circulation of painting, and by etchings of the Swiss Alps, they became the center of European attention. They became a center of European attention for another reason too. I don't want to speak too much about this, but it's an interesting problem because in the 17th and 18th century, it was a fundamental discussion about the origin of mountains, and some people be believed that the mountains were volcanic origin, others thought that it was more geological movements, and so you had two big schools, and all the important intellectuals in the 17th and 18th century wanted, they had their opinion. So it was a very important debate on this problem, how did the mountains become what they became? And so in order to decide, people had to go there. So Switzerland and the Swiss Alps became like a sort of lab, sort of gigantic laboratorium where people would come and they would observe nature. And then they would travel around and already in the 18th century you had a, a lot of travel books. And so you have to imagine people around 1800 full of ideas about Switzerland and Swiss nature and beautiful Swiss nature. So most of the people who <coughs> had culture, they would know Switzerland even if they didn't go there because they would know the paintings and etchings and descriptions and so on. So the idea of Switzerland changed completely. And Switzerland somehow, and Swiss landscape and nature in Switzerland became very fashionable. And this fashion went so far that uh, 
Uh, I give you one example, which is quite interesting. You all know the chalet, the cottage, and it has different things, so this vernacular architecture. And as you know, in Britain or in Ireland, I'm sure it's the same. Until 1800, no one was interested in chalets and cottages because these were poor men's uh, poor constructions. But around 1800, this became again very interesting, and so people started people from the city started to buy these places they were interested in and so you have chalets in um, you have chalets uh, and uh, uh, these kind of constructions they will be imitated everywhere and uh, so you can find uh, many of these uh, architectures I visited yesterday in Kilrudery uh, you have this uh, chalet and Fermorne and uh, in Ireland you have many examples and this is a uh, sort of very young fashion. It was born around 1800. So we could say that many places around Europe were Swissized or Swissized because uh, people built Swiss chalets in places where it has nothing to do, for example here in the region of Paris. And here you have other Swiss chalets in Britain and in Ireland and in Russia and many other places. So Switzerland was very fashionable. And even in the young discipline of landscape architecture, some patterns of the things which people discovered in the Swiss Alps were imitated. For example, the Swiss Alps are, are naturally or were naturally full of waterfalls until hydroelectricity almost destroyed everything. And so the waterfall became a central element in the landscape architecture and in the art of 18th and 19th century gardening. In what we call the picturesque garden, so, uh, the waterfall is a, uh, an important element, but the, uh, the waterfall was a direct imitation of Swiss examples. Not only Swiss examples, some were French too, but the most important examples were taken from the Swiss Alps. So we have imitations of this, is, it looks like uh, natural scenery, scenery, but in reality this is in, again in the region of Paris. And this is a completely man-built, man-made, a sort of collage, a sort of artificial and the full mountain again. And this full mountain is a citation of, an, of a real place in Switzerland. And if we look uh, to the publications in the 18th century, we see, for example, people who start to popularize landscape architecture. This looks like a natural place, but indeed, it's uh, in reality, it's something completely artificial. And uh, the person who uh, printed this, he wanted that people started to build places which look like the places we know in the Alps. So you see how the Alpine scenery represented in painting became more and more popular. And even Humphrey Repton, I showed you before, in his projects, takes he, he, he likes to highlight on some places which remind uh, his clients, who most of them did the grand tour and they would know about this new kind of sublimity, uh, he tries to invent forms which bring people back to the Swiss Alps, even if they don't go there. So, um, the, scenery, the idea of nature in Switzerland and of uh, Alpine scenery became extremely popular. <laughs> it was again, uh, painters like Turner and many others came to uh, see these places and uh, not only painters but tourists. And about 1800, uh, there are many people who say already, well, there are too many people here. So you have already the uh, problem of, uh, uh, of uh, crowds coming more and more and coming to see these beautiful places. And <laughs> at the same time, with the invention of the panorama, uh, there is a conference to the real places because, as you know, uh, with the invention of the panorama at the end of the 18th century, uh, one of the first things which the panorama makers would show are uh, panoramas of the mountains and especially of the Swiss Alps. And so, uh, in paying one pound, you could go to Switzerland without uh, going there. And so you could see the beauty of the Alpine scenery without actually traveling. So